Friends, let us uh, come to the concluding part of uh, offer and acceptance, in which we will be discussing first revocation, and after which probably we will be discussing uh, if the offer and acceptance is made, which is the place where the contract is concluded. But first, revocation. Friends, the law of revocation is very important to understand contracts. Why? Because once an offer is made and an acceptance is made, we have seen the statement saying that it is like a lighted matchstick to a train of gunpowder. It creates a legally binding obligation and hence it cannot either be withdrawn or called back. But I think the practicality of contracts today in modern world is about uh, you reconsidering the offer or reconsidering the acceptance. And this is what is called as the law of revocation. Revoke means to call back. Revoke means to withdraw. So once you made an offer, you would probably want to reconsider it. Why? Maybe because in the interim time, you have got a better offer. Or maybe you have changed your mind and you do not want to continue with the regular obligation. So, you know, parties must be given that kind of freedom to do revocation. However, there's no absolute kind of a freedom to do revocation because the law governs revocation. Now, first and foremost, you will notice friends, how can you revoke? I think that's very critical, right? Now, revocation friends has to be also communicated like the offer and acceptance has to be communicated. So, you have to give notice, you have to inform the other party about your intention to revoke. So, that intention must be communicated. So, by notices, I think one of the essential methods in which revocation can take place. So, what does the offerer do? He informs the uh, offeree uh, or one who is making the acceptance and by notice and please note notice can be written notice today or it can be oral notice it could be by email or any other mechanism but you give that notice and you can revoke. Uh, second you can revoke by lapse of time. Now lapse of time is very interesting friends for the reason that uh, every offer will be open only for a certain reasonable amount of time. You cannot expect the offer to be open for you know, say lifetime, right? It's not endless in that sense, depending upon the subject matter of the offer, depending upon who the offerer is and who the offeree is. Customary practices and trade practices can also apply, but you will always notice there is something called a reasonable time, right? If the time is mentioned, great. Now, for example, what is time being mentioned in an offer? I say, look, I'm willing to uh, sell my motorbike to you uh, for uh, 50,000. And uh, I expect that if you don't answer by this evening, this offer lapses, right? So this is what we say lapse, right? Time, as soon as say five or six, whatever is mentioned, once the time crosses, the offer lapses, right? This would not require revocation. This is called termination of an offer. Termination is by lapse of time. Revocation, there needs to be certain act by the parties to actually withdraw that kind of an offer. So, in any ways, uh, either through revocation or through the termination, the offer expires, right? It no longer exists for uh, it to be accepted in that sense, right? So, it's important for us to visualize, understand uh, these different, uh, uh, you know, modes of revocation. And I think uh, one of the important other modes of revocation is by death and insanity of the offer. Friends, many contracts are based on the personal character of the offerer and the offering. We may say some of these are contract for personal service. Say uh, a doctor, he promises to do a surgery. Unfortunately, the doctor dies before uh, an acceptance of the surgery is made. Uh, what happens to the offer? I think the offer must die with the offerer. Right? Similarly, insanity, because since sometimes people may turn unsound. This could be within a month, two months, three months, and hence, Suppose it's a sale of immobile property, generally the offer can be open for three months. That's kind of a reasonable time if agreed by the parties. So, unsoundness of mind and uh, uh, death are an important mode of, uh, you know, what we call as termination of an offer. Why we call it termination is because once there is death, there is no one to recall it, revoke it. Revocation requires an express uh, notice, act or conduct. Uh, these are where law says, uh, look, the offer unfortunately gets terminated on death or insanity of the offer, right? Uh, also, offer can be revoked uh, if uh, there is non-fulfillment of a condition precedent to acceptance, right? 
Now, what could these mean? For example, uh, suppose in the offer I say that, look, uh, before you can make an acceptance, uh, you have to pay me uh, advance of 5,000. Right? This is to keep the offer open. Right? If you don't pay 5,000 rupees, the offer itself is not going to be that. Now you think, you think, you think, you don't pay the 5,000 rupees as advance, but later on you want to make an acceptance. That acceptance will not be valid simply because of the fact that you have not completed one kind of a condition precedent to acceptance. And that condition was that the offer will be valid only if 5,000 rupees as advance was to be given. So you have not given the 5,000 rupees as advance. He has not accepted it. The offer itself is not going to be valid. So no valid acceptance can take place in those circumstances. Right. So that's also one you know, very important mode of uh, the offer actually expiring, not having legal existence. It does not create an obligation and no acceptance can actually create a contract to that extent. Right. Uh, another way in which uh, an offer uh, is uh, expired or an offer gets expired or is no longer valid is by what we call as a counter offer. So I make an offer, I told you, you again make a counter offer. You don't make an acceptance. You actually put something else and send it back to me. It's a counter offer. Okay? So the original offer is gone. The counter offer now exists on the table. It is for me to accept an offer. So that's what counter offer is. Also, uh, offer can be revoked uh, by non-acceptance in the prescribed and usual mode. Now, this is where you will notice that an offerer not only makes an offer to sell his house, but he also tells you how to make the acceptance. Okay? Uh, say the acceptance should be uh, by letter or post. Uh, the acceptance should be based on these, these, these uh, conditions. And uh, he states everything that is required uh, to actually make the acceptance. So the acceptance uh, mode is prescribed by the offerer. Now, if you do not use the same mode for acceptance, the offer expires. Simple, right? Because please note, the offer is the initiation of the legal relationship or the legal obligation in contracts. The offerer has the right to make the prescription about how the contract is to be made, what are the terms and conditions of the contract, and what is the mode of the contract to be concluded. So he can make those prescriptions entirely. It is for the acceptor to just follow those prescriptions. If he does not and if he adds something to that prescription, it is a counter offer. So anything that the acceptor does that is in contradiction or contravention of the conditions of the offer, then uh, it is just a counter offer and hence the offer will expire. So this is very important for us to understand that uh, an offer stands valid until any of these things happen to the offer. Uh, uh, it could be revocation, it could be say the time is lapsed, non fulfillment of condition precedent by death or insanity of the offer, by counter offer, by non acceptance of uh, uh, the offer in the prescribed or the usual mode. All of these will make the offer invalid or non existing in the eyes of law. Hence, there is no obligation of the offerer because he completes uh, the obligation or he terminates the obligation, and hence, nothing further than that can happen. Neither acceptance can happen, nor a contract enforceable by law will come into place. Finally, uh, of course, you know, subsequent illegality. This is very, very important, friends. You have to understand that suppose I make an offer to sell my house to you, okay, and you take three months time, you pay me in advance. Like this is how a booking is usually being done. You pay me uh, an advance, you say, okay, I will arrange for the finance, I will arrange for the documents. After three months, I will come back and then probably I uh, finally conclude the contract. Uh, we will try and have an offer and acceptance for you. Now, interestingly, please note, friends, in those three months, illegality can creep into the contract and how it can be done. Probably the government has already issued a notice for acquisition of that property. And it says no longer any sale is going to be valid regarding the sale. So, there could be illegality, there could be public uh, policy that could actually intervene or hinder the sale of that particular property. If that happens, probably the offer is no longer going to be valid. Now here, please note, there is no express action of the offerer. He is neither revoking it, nor is there some kind of a termination due to death or insanity. No, right? This is some external agency that affects the offer and hence it is no longer within the offerer's hand to actually uh, uh, you know, in one sense, uh, continue with the offer. If it does so, it will amount to illegality. 
right? So anything that is externality, for example, we say, let's assume in those three months, uh, there is unprecedented flood and the entire region is flooded. The house uh, is also destroyed or the subject matter of the offer is also destroyed. In those cases, what is the use of the offer being existing, right? So you expect the offer to expire, terminate and no longer be valid. So these are modes of revocation of offer. To a larger extent, friends, some of these also apply for revocation as well. Right? So revocation of offer and revocation of acceptance. But remember, it's easy to discuss revocation of offer. You can only revoke offer before its acceptance. Once there is acceptance, revocation right uh, doesn't come into place at all. Right? Now take the case of Dickinson versus Dobbs. It's a very interesting case of 1876. What happened in this case was a person agreed to sell his property to another individual. Right? This was through a written document. And he says that, look, uh, my offer to sell uh, my property to you is going to be open till Friday 9 a.m. Right? Now, in 1876, you will notice that this uh, document was probably sent by post and uh, it was expected that uh, you know the acceptance will also come by post. Right? So Friday 9 a.m., right? this was the time that was given. So uh, uh, the acceptor could make an acceptance before Friday 9 a.m. However, you know, on Thursday, uh, of course, I think A got a better offer. Okay? He had not heard anything from B. So on Thursday, A got a better offer. So what he did was he sold the property to C. Right? When he sold this property to C, nothing had come from B. Not, no, no communication had come. So when this sale happens on Thursday, right? He had to wait till Friday. That's what he said, has promised to be. But on Thursday, when he sells this to C, is that revocation of the offer? Right? Now you will notice that revocation means anything that affects the validity of the contract. Now I promise to sell it to you, sure, but you, you have not yet made an acceptance. Till you have made that acceptance, I can always sell it to something. This is what revocation means. So this is revocation by conduct, where the subject matter is being given to some third party. Right? Now, if B makes an acceptance on Friday, right, that acceptance would be invalid because revocation precedes acceptance. And in this case, uh, of course, notice of the sale should have been given uh, and that would suffice. Uh, A's right to sell the property to C because no acceptance has ever taken place. So this is where you have to understand that in contracts, this kind of possibility to withdraw offer and acceptance definitely arises. Now coming to acceptance friends, you will notice that even acceptance can be uh, revoked. Yes, like on offer, acceptance can also be revoked. However, the condition is uh, you know, there was differences of opinion in common law uh, because of Anson's statement. Because, you know, Anson had said acceptance is like a lighted matchstick to a train of the law. Once there is acceptance, the legal obligation commences. Can you really recall that acceptance? Right? Common law said you cannot. But if you read the Indian Contract Act 1872, it is very clear that acceptance can also be revoked. However, the condition is very simple. It should be revoked before it reaches the offerer. What it reaches the offerer? The communication of acceptance reaches the offerer. Now, these are very simple situations for us to understand. Now, let's assume <coughs> there are two parties. One is in Bangalore, the other is in Delhi. Right? The person in Bangalore makes an offer to sell his house. Okay, He writes a letter. These are letters, situations of letters which we have understood. He writes a letter to the person in Delhi and says, I am willing to sell my property to you for 10 lakh rupees. Uh, okay, so you have time till Friday, 9 a.m. to make the acceptance. Now the Delhi fellow, uh, he receives the letter. So there is communication of an offer. Then he also prepares another letter to make the acceptance. Right? From Delhi, he actually posts this letter. So he puts it in the postal mail. And uh, this letter is supposed to reach uh, the Bangalore film by Thursday evening. Right? So say Wednesday, he decides to post the letter. Now the letter is in transit. Between Wednesday to Thursday, the letter is in transit. Acceptance is made and it is posted, but it is yet to reach the Bangalore fellow who is the offer. 
Now, in this time between Wednesday and Thursday, before the letter reaches, can the Bangalore fellow, uh, uh, you know, who is expected to re re receive the acceptance, he has no knowledge of the acceptance. Please note, no knowledge, no communication, right? So, is the acceptance complete if Bangalore has not received uh, that acceptance? Friends, you notice that for acceptance, communication and knowledge is also relevant, which means the Bangalore fellow should come to know of the acceptance. If he does not come to know of the acceptance, there is no acceptance, despite the fact that the Delhi fellow has dispatched the letter, which means that the Delhi fellow can exercise his revocation before this letter reaches Bangalore. So between Wednesday, by the time he has posted the letter, to the time the letter reaches Bangalore, that is Thursday evening, revocation by Delhi can happen. Now you will ask me, sir, how does this revocation? Very simple, friends. The revocation should happen by using some faster means of communication. Now post is probably slow. Can I call up from Delhi to Bangalore and say, look, I posted this letter, but still I don't intend to, uh, you know, make an acceptance. You can go and send it to some third party. Maybe yes, telephone can be used, fax can be used, emails can be used as a modern means of instantaneous communication. But the revocation can be made before communication of acceptance reaches the offerer. This is definitely acceptable under the Indian Contract Act as well. Right? So these are very important aspects of revocation because please note in India, I think there is a law on equity which very clearly says if the offerer can revoke, he can change his mind. Why shouldn't the acceptor also revoke and change his mind? Both should have uh, equal rights to recall. Uh, but the condition is do so before it starts affecting the rights of other parties. Right? Once the right of the other party commences in a legal obligation, you uh, have no right existing to infringe, affect his right adversely. I think that is the process in which the law of revocation uh, generally takes place. Now, look at revocation that can happen in a unilateral contract. Friends, contracts are of two kinds. Bilateral, between both the parties, where there is offer, there is acceptance, both the parties communicate and the contract comes into existence. Unilateral contracts are usually one-sided contracts. Right. Say the reward case in uh, what we talked about the Larman Shukla versus Gaurita. Right. The landlady announces the reward. It's unilateral, it's one sided. Until that acceptance happens from one of the persons in the community, which is a general offer, there is, it's a unilateral, like one sided. I make an announcement. Now, can revocation happen in a, a reward case like Larman Shukla? Can Gaurita, after making this announcement of 501 rupees, revoke it? The answer is yes. She can before it is accepted. And for that, what she should do is, friends, she should actually use the prescribed mode of communication of the offer to the revocation of the offer itself. So, however, the offer is made, the same mode can be used for revocation. If it is done, the revocation still stand valid. What is the uh, way in which the offer was made? It was announced. Maybe pamphlets were distributed, uh, uh, maybe advertisements were given. If you use the same manner in which the offer is made, the revocation also stands. Right? One. Two, your revocation is important in terms of time. Suppose he had found that boy before your revocation, acceptance is one. Right? So time will be a critical factor in deciding whether the revocation is valid or not, because in such kind of general offers, you never know when the acceptance has started or when the acceptance is concluded. Right? So we cannot entirely say that whatever, just because you have communicated, your revocation stands valid because you do not know who has accepted it in the general crowd, who has found the missing why it is not yet uh, uh, being told to you. But that time will be the relevant factor in deciding revocation in such unilateral contracts. Okay. I already have discussed the distinction between uh, revocation and termination. Uh, termination, friends, means that there is operation of some kind of a law due to which the law says there is termination of a offer, right? So law intervenes and comes to this conclusion, right? Termination. Now, for example, death and insanity. You cannot expect the parties to notify, right? So death, automatically the law must come in to say death operates as a ground for termination of an offer, right? Uh, uh, but in India, friends, please note, the law very clearly says in case of death and insanity, uh, it is important to uh, uh, communicate, it is important to have knowledge. 
right? Uh, unless knowledge exists, death and insanity should not kind of automatically operate. So this is a small uh, issue about uh, how uh, we talk about death and insanity uh, as grounds of termination, right? Now, let's understand uh, in, the, in, in the end how employment termination happens. Now, you know you are in employment. Right. The employer is, uh, it's not a tenure employment, but can the notice of termination be issued? It can be, right? So, that is a notice of termination of the contract. Similarly, notice of termination of an offer can also be made. Now, for example, let's assume that a company has given you an offer. It's a campus placement, right? They give you an offer then and then, right? You are yet to give acceptance because they will say acceptance is the day of your joining, not before. So your date of joining, say, is three months or six months. You are yet to clear your final uh, semester examination, get yet to get your degree. This is a campus placement, so pre-campus uh, placement offers. Right? It is given to you, but they say acceptance is only when you come and join. Now, in between this time, can a company uh, withdraw its offer that is given to you before you have accepted? Because the terms of acceptance are laid down. The condition, the prescribed mode of acceptance is also laid down. Please note it down. Right? The company clearly says what is acceptance in this case. You mentally or intentionally or you know uh, thinking that yes, I have joined uh, or I have prepared the, the email already doesn't uh, uh, make an acceptance because the offer has prescribed the mode of acceptance and the mode of acceptance is the date of joining. Till then, there is no acceptance. So, in this interim time, if the company rethinks, you know, because maybe, you know, there is a, uh, uh, there is less business, uh, there is some kind of code that has come in, so they don't want more employees, what they may do? The pre-placement kind of an offer, the company can withdraw, they can revoke, right? So, this is kind of a practical example that I thought you should know how revocation can even happen in an employment contract. Friends, moving on to our last uh, part of discussion in understanding offer and acceptance of the first uh, essential uh, ingredient or uh, essential test of uh, making an agreement a contract, uh, we have always come to this conclusion that uh, offer and acceptance makes a contract. Right? It is for both the parties now for the obligation to commence once this comes into place. Uh, and hence, uh, coming back to my earlier example of Bangalore and Delhi, you will notice the question then arises is, uh, when is a contract made? Friends, contract is made only when acceptance is communicated and when acceptance reaches the offer. Contract is not made when the acceptance is dispatched. Right? Until that dispatched acceptance reaches the offer, the acceptance is not complete. So, acceptance completion results in a contract. Right? It results in a, what we call as a binding obligation. So, we have to understand when the contract is made and second, most importantly, where the contract is made. Because friends, as soon as you come to know when and where, it is easy for us to decide. If suppose there are disputes that arise from these contracts, where will be the jurisdiction of the court to try such kinds of disputes? Now, you must be immediately coming to this conclusion saying, Sir, don't you think in modern contracts, uh, the place of dispute uh, is already pre-decided? It could be the case. The parties can decide uh, where should be the place of dispute. So it's a freedom that they can exercise. But again, there are rules. Uh, it's not an entire absolute freedom. It depends upon also whether that kind of a choice of the jurisdiction, uh, the courts actually can exercise that choice. Now, suppose uh, I told you a party is in Delhi, the party is in Madhya. Both the parties say Mumbai should be the jurisdiction, right? That is when they, but whether the Mumbai court can exercise jurisdiction in the first place, that has to be really tested, isn't it? So, uh, so where parties can decide, again, the convenience of the court and the rules under civil procedure code will be answered. But even before we come to this modern kind of choice of jurisdiction clause, let's understand in a normal process, say in the early days, uh, uh, and in the foundational days of contract, where is the contract made? Is it made where the offerer resides or is it the place where the acceptor resides? Where should be the contract concluding? Because once the contract concludes, that is the place where automatically the local courts will have jurisdiction 
in case to decide or in case also to see whether the offer revoked or whether the acceptance acceptance is valid whether to hold the contract void or not whether there is a breach or not so the courts may have to intervene because then we will test the enforceability of the same right an agreement enforceable by law is a contract enforceable then enforceability is to be tested by the courts of law so friends primarily you will notice that uh, the place where the acceptance is finally communicated is the place where the contract is made. Because see, I start the offer from Bangalore, it goes to Delhi. From there, the acceptance has been posted. But the acceptance finally reaches me. Once it reaches me, only then the contract is concluded. So Bangalore ideally would be the place where the contract is made. And two, once the acceptance reaches me is the time when the contract is made. Before that, the contract is not. Okay. So the time starts obligations within the parties place also defines the jurisdiction in case courts have to exercise this. So this I think is an important element for us to understand unless and until the parties have decided to give the jurisdiction of the contract to some other place at some other time. Now please note in modern day contracts we say look I will put the signatures today but the contract will only commence after three months. So you may decide the time of the contractual obligation to commence at a future period. So this is also possible, but if nothing of this kind is agreed or prescribed, the place as well as the time of the contract, then in those places, uh, those circumstances, uh, this rule that the acceptor uh, has communicated the acceptance and the offeree has received that acceptance, the place of the offeree receiving the acceptance is the place where the uh, jurisdiction of the court will lie and that is where the contract is made and that is the time in which the contract uh, so I think uh, finally, let's conclude by asking ourselves, friends, uh, very importantly, all contracts are agreements, but all agreements are not contracts. I think we have understood by now which of these agreements that can be created as a contract uh, and to create that, how important a valid offer is and how important a valid acceptance is. Right? I have also given you the example of a MOU, that is Memorandum of Understanding, or even a letter of intent. Is it a contract, whether it is a contract? Right? All this will depend upon the intention of the parties. So the intention theory will be very relevant for agreements to be treated as contract. Otherwise, an MOU can be a plain agreement, a letter of intent can be a plain agreement without it being enforceable at a contract in a court of law. To be made enforceable, offer and acceptance are very important. Most important, friends, in modern day contract, it is an intention. The intention can be positively uh, expressed saying, yes, this is a binding agreement. Or it can be negatively expressed saying that it is a non-binding agreement. This is a discretion that parties obviously have and uh, you can continue to keep agreements. And please note, though the agreement is not enforceable in a court of law as a contract, the agreement itself can result in some private obligations, but not a contractual obligation. That is a possibility that can, they can continue to have in this country. So I think uh, uh, with this, we should close the discussion on offer and acceptance and now we should move to our second most important part that we would want to discuss is on capacity of parties because i told you capacity to offer capacity to acceptance we say capacity to contract who can make a contract who has been given the capacity to make a contract is also very very important now going forward friends look at section 10 of the indian contract section 10 of the indian contract act says that look there are only certain categorization of people who should be given the contract right? right? So everyone in society cannot make a contract, right? No, there are certain people whom we have to exclude. Why? Why? Because see, contract creates some kind of an obligation to the other party. You have to take that commercial call. You have to understand the terms and conditions. You should be willing to take that responsibility. The legal system has to trust that, yes, you are capable of taking that legal responsibility unless that trust the legal system as you do not qualify to contract. Let's take labor for the child labor. Now we have said child labor for A and B C reasons, you know, it is uh, protecting the interest of the child. Yes, we have to. Children need to go to school, that they also have to do. Right? But we don't trust children to have that kind of mental development of capacity to understand contracts and hence we say, you know, minors are excluded from contracts. Right? In labor law also minors are uh, kind of excluded, but again, you know, we have created some exceptions over there. Hazardous activity, no, you should not at all because it can affect the health of the child. 
So till 18 years in hazardous industries, you should not. But between, between 14 and 18, probably for your own livelihood in non-hazardous activity, if it's possible, should we allow that? Maybe we can create an exception because of the econo uh, uh, social circumstances that the country has. Right? So I think even in labor law, while you want to be employed, there are conditions of labor, and the legal system tries to protect the infant or the infancy, uh, uh, infancy of the uh, child. So you have to protect that innocency of the child and the legal system must come to his rescue as well. Now when you talk about capacity of party strengths, you probably divide the capacity of parties into two kinds, mental and physical. Right? Physical incapacities can also be that. Right? We will have to probably discuss that in some sense and we will come to that in a little while. But mental incapacity friends, arises basically because of your age, right? that the maturity of mind has not come to the stage where you should be allowed to make a contract. Since minor contracts is a major limit, <laughs> why would you be asking? Because the law is an 1872. We have actually uh, applied it to the Indian Contract Act, but the Indian Contract Act itself does not prescribe it. No, it doesn't. It just says minors are excluded, you have to be an adult. That's all it says. But what is the age of majority? Indian Contract Act has never specified. And that's why we refer to an, another legislation called Indian Majority Act. It's a complementary legislation to the Indian Contract. You can also refer to the Indian Constitution because the Indian, the Indian Constitution says you have to be 18 before you can vote. Right? So there are similar such legislations that actually prescribe age as a qualification to exercising certain rights. Here also there is an age and you have to be a major and the Indian Majority Act says you have to be 18. Please note earlier the Indian Majority Act Act had said you should be 21. Even for voting, we had the age of 21. We reduced it from 21 to 18. Similarly, the Indian Majority Act was amended to bring this age from 21 to 18. It can be further reduced to 16, maybe at some point of time. But right now, as it stands, the Indian Majority Act very clearly, which is applicable to the Indian Contract Act, says you are. Now, why minor is a headache? The reason, friends, is can you really exclude minors from Commercial transactions, commercial obligations in today's times. Can you clearly say that minor contracts are not enforceable? Okay. Rather, if you look at this case called uh, Mohiri BB versus Dhamodas Ghosh. In this case, you know, the court says the minor contract is void ab initio. Right? A void contract has no recognitions in the eyes of law. No recognition was. Rather, the court goes further and says ab initio, void ab initio, which means forget no recognition, it has no existence from the very beginning, ab initio. From the very beginning itself, it's not there. Forget not being valid, not being enforceable, and being void. It is void ab initio. At this point of time, when the Mori Bibi case was decided, friends, the intention of the court was that they have to protect the innocency of the minor. Otherwise, minors will be exploited. They will be very vulnerable to uh, uh, these commercial uh, bargains, which usually are you know, unequal. Most commercial bargains are unequal. Right? One party always is having a strong position. So what he does is he dominates it, he exploits it. And here is you know, minors who feel, uh, you know, but they may be also exploited by contractual terms and conditions. So the court was very rigid. They said, no, we will treat every minor contract as an initial contract. So parties will absolutely not get any remedies whatsoever under the Indian contract. Right? The law will not recognize it from the very inception itself. Now, why should you know the distinction between void and void ab initial is because, friends, please note. In case, let's assume that the contract is void. For one instance, that could be a possibility that the court says the contract is void. Even if it is void, friends, you will notice that under section 65 of the Indian contract, even if in case of void agreements, the principal rule of unjust enrichment can apply. Yeah. So whatever you have received unjustly, because it is unjust, the contract is what unjust, just enrichment is allowed by the contract. Unjust enrichment is not. 
So under section 65 of the Indian Contract Act, unjust enrichment has to be written back even in void agreements. But in void ab initio, there is nothing that has been prescribed at all in the Indian Contract Act. And hence probably the judges said it's ab initio, which means no remedies whatsoever. If it was merely void, we can probably give you remedies. Except this case, you know, we have not come across many cases where the courts have come by the strict rule of abolition. No, not, not many cases. So this is first part of the Mohiri Bibi case. The strict rule of exclusion of minor from contracts. That is what this case is. Okay. From the strict rule of minors being excluded to contract, did we make exceptions? That is the journey that we have to understand at this point. Okay. Now what happened in the Mohiri Bibi case, the Ghosh case was a minor. He wanted uh, some money. Okay. So he had a property. He went to a money lender. He said, I want uh, to mortgage this property. You give me some money. Okay. The, uh, you know, the money lender, as usual, you know, we had the Zamindari system, the money lending system, uh, exploitative systems were existing even uh, uh, post independence. Uh, during British times, there were regulations of the same to bring in fairness of money lending business. But in this case, the money lender got an opportunity. He, uh, you know, said, "Let me check the age. See, money lenders usually know the law." So he asked this person, "Are you a major or a minor?" He says, "I am a major." Now, looking at someone's pay spec, can you really find out? And during those days, there was no verification that the money lender could do with an Aadhaar card or a birth certificate. So he trusted the minor, saying, "Okay, he may be of age, and hence he can probably enter into contract. He can execute a mortgage deal, and I can give him the loan." So based on this kind of a uh, uh, so called trust the money lender enters into a contract with this person who claims to be a major but is actually a minor. And please note, if you read the facts in this case, at this point of time, the age of majority was 21 as per the majority. So you have to keep that in mind. Today it has been reduced to 18. So, uh, fine, you know, the contract was made. Uh, he wanted some 20,000 rupees. Initially, 10,000 rupees was granted. Mortgage deed was executed. Now, the minor in this case was very clear, very, very clear. He did two things. First, he actually misrepresented his age deliberately, intentionally. He right? was very clear, so he misrepresented. Second, what he did was he went on to go to the court. He actually sues. It's not the money lender suing to record the money. He sues and goes to the court and says, Look, a minor contract is actually void. At least declare it to be so and uh, cancel the mortgage. It's a minor who approaches to the court, mischievously. Now the court views this whole document, checks the age of the minor and then comes to the conclusion, look, under the Indian contract, there is a very clear prohibition. No minor case allowed to make a contract. This is a minor contract and hence, please note from the very beginning, it is void at any show. No recognition, no remedy whatsoever. Now, the judges did in this time, you know, they were, uh, while they were looking at the Indian contract, at least note, they were also influenced by common law contract, which was pronounced by judges, because this was British times. Uh, so, you know, even in common law, uh, there were legislations that protected minors, legislations like Infant Relief Act. But the court here says, because we are declaring it as an issue, please note, the mortgage deed ca stands cancelled. Please, okay. So the property goes back to the minor, and the contract has no uh, value. But what about the ten thousand rupees that the minor has taken? If you apply the principle of unjust enrichment, shouldn't the minor have written the ten thousand rupees? The answer is yes. But the court in this case says that would have been possible if we had declared it as void. But now we are saying void again. So nothing. The minor has no obligation, and the money lender has to go back to his original position. So burn your hand. If you enter into a contract with the minor, we are going by the strict rule, we have to protect the minor and the rule is minor cannot be allowed to enter into contract. Now this strict rule friends, is important for us to understand because what it clearly says is because it has no recognition from the very beginning, once the minor becomes a major, he cannot ratify it. See ratification means you are giving validity to something that was happened previously, right? Say something that has happened yesterday. Today you want to uh, admit it or accept it, you ratify it. So if suppose we come to this conclusion that minor agreements are void, 
Uh, once you become a major, can you ratify? Can you say, okay, no, I have done this, so I continue to take this obligation. So the court said, no, we should not allow that. Right? Because then it will give retrospective kind of validation to minor contracts, which may not be in the right uh, uh, of the legal system, right of the minors. So we should say no recognition, issue, no ratification is also possible. It's something that we must permit. So that's how the court started strictly protecting the minor, strictly applying the Indian contract act and excluding minors from any right they may have in, uh, in contract. But a case that followed a little later, uh, the Lahore High Court also evaluated that look, if we allow the minor to escape from his own faults, what was the fault? Concealing age. If we uh, give benefit to a minor, uh, uh, for cheating uh, his age and then getting such contracts, wouldn't that uh, you know be an uh, wouldn't that be a, 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 you know, a, a wrong message to give? Right. See, interesting difference in contract law. We say one who seeks equity. Now, what is equity? The remedy from the court. He wants uh, the contract to be adequately decided between both the parties, justly decided between the both the parties. He is seeking equity from the court. He is coming to the court for some remedies. One who seeks equity, friends, please note the rule is you should also do equity. If you have not done, and this is inequity, what falsely representing your age, mischievously entering your contract, concealing your age, this is a mischief. Right? In second, we also put a doctrine saying that the doctrine of clean hands. Right? If you are seeking justice, you please come to the court with clean hands, which means you should not have contributed to either the fault. You should not have contributed uh, to uh, any kind of uh, injustice in the society. You should not have cheated. If you are clean, the court will do equally. If you are unclean, why should the court? So, doctrine of unclean hands. So, in Khan Guru versus Laka Singh case, the court said, right, we still say the minor contracts are not valid. Okay, we are not going to give it enforceability. However, under equity, the minor must return. Uh, uh, any unjust enrichment that he actually takes. So, section 65 was brought in, it was interpreted and it says something like this, if in a void agreement or a void contract, anyone receives any advantage, he has an obligation to give that advantage back. That's it. So, contract will not have any enforcement, but you cannot retain the advantage that you have already derived from such a void or an unenforceable agreement. Right? That is very clear in this case. So, I think uh, what the Khan Gur versus Lakha Singh case did was it changed the Mohri BB perception, saying from a strict rule, I think first try and understand the mischief. Right? If there is a mischief that is committed by the minor, I think the minor has to bear the liability of that mischief. It is not that the legal system should entirely protect a minor. Yes, that entire protection will only happen if the minor is not at fault. If the minor is uh, 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 coming to the court with clean hands, only then he can seek the protection of the court, and the court can actually apply the majority doctrine and protect the minor 